Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, we're excited for you to spend that this afternoon with these wonderful historians, storytellers, and cultural bearers. And of course, it's always great fun to visit with Donna and Kathy. My name is Marla Novo, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Programs here at the MAW. Thank you for being our guest today. And if you're a MAW member, thank you for your support. Um, this event is presented in partnership with UCSC University Library, and I'm delighted that it's taking place at the MAW, where we love to share space for storytelling and exchange ideas about art, history, and culture. And now I'd like to introduce you to George Al Jr. Thank you, Marla. Thank you for coming, everybody. I am here to introduce Donna Meckes and Kathy Miller, Kathy Meckes Miller and Sandy Leiden. I got involved in this book because I'm a groupie of Sandys and, <laughs> and Don, like a lot of you here. And Donna and I were in many of Sandy's classes. And in the course of whatever class it was, whether it was the Chinese, the Japanese, or the Slavonians, or whomever, some of these stories would come up about the Croatians, the Slavonians. How they were called lots of different things. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> and, so, and so I thought to myself, I don't know much about these, these stories and the history of the Croatians, but I sure would like to know more. And Sandy would always be giving them a little bit of, a, giving Donna a little bit of a hint, saying, Donna, you should write the book, and I'll help you get, get you on your way. And um, when that happened, I'm answering the question, George, what are you going to talk about? How did you get involved in this? Why did you publish the book? And to encourage Donna, because it was a daunting task, that's not what she normally does, then, then I said something like, if you write it, I'll publish it. And it's kind of like a, a dare. <laughs> well, I didn't know what she was going to do was get help, which is a smart thing to do. She went to her sister, Kathy, and the two of them are really a team. And they came out with the most wonderful, wonderful book. I love this book. I read it so many times. I love the picture on the cover of the Borina family. See the two, at the time, um, young women there and their, and their dad. They were farmers, grew everything, were smart with land. Now they have one of the biggest foundations to, to help the community in the whole county. What is, is that's one of my favorite stories, and and the other story that I really love is the reference to Jack London and the Valley of the Moon. So I see people shaking their going like this, so you know the story, and the story there is that Jack London a really smart, been around the world kind of a guy, is writing this book, and the main character is writing down from the Napa area down to Carmel. He passes by Watsonville, and he's telling his girlfriend the story about these people who recently came to America and they've made Watsonville the apple capital of the world. 
What a story. And of course, he says to her, I don't know how they do it. They came over here. They didn't have anything. And now they've made Watsonville the apple capital of the world. And of course, if you have read the book, you can see how it was done. He was astounded. And, and I think that that's a, um, a good lesson or a good thing to remember. Um, very, very valuable there. How was it done? Well, in this book, it tells you how it was done. So if you want to know, and you need to know, and you want to teach your, your grandchildren, you, you can do it too. Okay. Now, that's all I'm going to say about you guys. I love you guys. This book is so wonderful. So Sandy comes next. And, of course, a lot of things, a lot of lectures, classes, information, in this area would not would not have gotten off the ground. Wouldn't people wouldn't know about it without Sandy, because Sandy is a wonderful storyteller, drum um, uh, drum major, raconteur, and, and 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 he gets really people really interested. Sandy can even get people interested in the Chinese. Now, the Chinese are about 1% of the population and have been for a long time um, in Santa Cruz County. But he can sell, he can write a book, Chinese Gold, that weighs about five pounds, <laughs> is about 550 pages, and sell 13,000 copies right here. Wonderful thing. And in the course of that, he has changed the image or set the image. He has made the image of the Chinese. And um, I, being Chinese, have had the benefit of that. And I say, geez, how did I get this halo around me? <laughs> I know, it was because of Sandy. So um, I owe Sandy a lot. Sandy, you're up next. Okay. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. So the way this works, this history business, um, if you want to have the last word, outlive the bastards. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that point. Um, and I'm, I'm in a building which I was fortunate enough to be involved in before, when this was still the jail, um, and we met the Friends of the Octagon met in the Octagon. It's named that because of the, you know, never mind. Um, and, and I was trying to explain to my lovely wife as we were walking across, because you never want to try to cross the street from the parking lot directly. You just don't. You got to get to the light and then you come across. People always wonder, how do you get there? It's easy. You, you find the three ball. And there have been times, not enough in my view, when graffiti people have painted the three on the red ball, because if you've played pool, oh, okay. Uh, that, uh. So, so in 1918, when the, when the flu epidemic started here and they passed an ordinance in Santa Cruz to have a mask ordinance, um, <clears throat> the very first day that it was running, um, uh, the, the ordinance was in place, the policeman who was walking the streets somewhere on Pacific Avenue encountered two women um, who were not wearing a mask. Um, and he, he stopped them and said, you know, there's a mask ordinance, you've got to be wearing a mask. And they both held up their arms and said, we are. 
And he said, no, you're supposed to be, and they said, we, it doesn't say that in the ordinance. All it says is you have to wear it. To me, that's a, a, a quintessential Santa Cruz story. Um, look, look for the, look for the loop, loop, loophole and um, go there. So, boy, this goes back a long ways. Um, I, I worked on the Irish, I worked on the, um, the Azorians, who you know as the Portuguese, um, and the Chinese and the Japanese, and, but there was this sort of lump in the history, sort of squatting right in the middle and toward the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I kept running into them. In fact, I grew up in Hollister and we had some itches, that was what we called them. Um, there was the Boroviches and the Simonoviches, and, and, um, and I had no idea who they were then. Uh, they did go to Mass, I knew that. Um, so that gave us a certain kindred, they must know a little Latin anyway. So I, I, I began to fuss around with this community, and what I learned was, who, I asked people, I'd go to Watsonville and say, who are these people? Oh, those are the Slavonians. So I would go to Google, there was no Google, but you know, I'd go look up Slavonian, and I didn't, I found Slovenians, but then that didn't help. And, and the whole idea of when you're working with a community and trying to gain trust is you have to know more than they do about their own history. No, you do. That was how I got I got into the, the Al family was I interviewed um, George's dad and um, brought photographs that they'd never seen and told them stories that they didn't know. That's a rule in, in, um, in interviewing. You have to know everything before you go to the interview. Um, and so, I, 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 but I was having trouble. <clears throat> the word Balkan. The word Balkan is a verb as well as a noun. Balkanize means contention, confusion, a mess, all right? If, if somebody says that a community has been Balkanized, that means that it's not getting along at all inside, all right? And, and this was a community that came from that part of the country. When I first got into European history, which for about 20 minutes, I found, I found Asia less confusing, if you can imagine that. Um, and I thought Chinese dynasties were simple compared to the European eras. Um, and, and people would say, well, you know, there's, well, there's Herzegovina, but then there's, and then they were part of Hungary, but nah, they were part of Austria, but then they were part of Austria and Hungary, what? So I studied Asia just to be to get into a simpler simpler subject. So now I'm trying to find out who the Slavonians were and what was that all about. And in the process, I tried. Um, I made entrees. I tried, and it, and it's hard sometimes to develop trust when you're from outside a community. Um, it took me a long time uh, with the Chinese community, actually, and it took me even longer in some ways with the Japanese, because all communities have hesitancy. Um, and, and there's always a moment in the interview when they put their hand over the microphone or ask you to turn it off and say, um, well, I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. Okay. And, and we always honor that. Um, and we never expect it um, because it gives us, it's tough to have those kind of secrets and not tell them. I mean, you know, my God, did you know the part about, no, you can't, I can't tell them that. So, so in the process, I, would, I, I encountered these wonderful, gentle, mostly men who I'd been referred to, but they would always say, well, you know, I, I really don't have time. Um, but you gotta talk to Luca, or you gotta talk to Michael, or you gotta talk to John. And I would be passed around gently, but I was always working around the edges. Um, and I, I came to believe, again, thinking about the place they came from, that there's 
There's something they're not telling us. There's secrets here, and, and, and they're being very close. Um, interestingly, just today, I got an interesting answer to that phenomenon from, from Donna when she said, no, they just didn't think that their stories were worthwhile. That's a great answer, by the way, if you think about it. That people often don't think that their own stories are really important, but they all are. All stories are important. Um, all stories are a piece of the fabric and piece of the puzzle. So then Nikki Silva. Now Nikki Silva, who used to work a lot here uh, and is a Peabody award-winning broadcaster um, a, 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 of Azorian descent, uh, right? She and she could talk anybody into getting an interview at their, in their kitchen. Anybody. So she decided to do an exhibit on the community, and she started, and she ran into the same thing. Boom, 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 all around the edges. And she, she got enough. I, it was a wonderful exhibit, and it, but there was, it didn't have the texture, it didn't have, so, so the puzzle for me always was that, there's, there's a contradiction here. On the one hand, they wouldn't talk to us, and perhaps for the reasons that Donna describes. I hope there's no secrets in there that they shouldn't be telling. But on the other hand, there's a, there's a pride, and it shows up. When Mr. Letnich built the building, in downtown Watsonville, in the middle of town, that was the Letnich building, 1914, right? Did I get that? Good. By the way, uh, the statute of limitations, for those of you that are former students of mine, I can still change grades. <laughs> it hasn't expired. So if you don't respond with enough oomph, D's and F's all the way across. But there's no draft anymore, so you know it doesn't really matter. Nothing will happen. Um, so, so there's that. There, there's a there, there's a sense, there's an incredible pride, but then there's also this reticence, this sort of secretive thing, not secretive and negative. And, but my favorite. So let's say you're driving out to the fairgrounds. You going to the fairgrounds? Uh, by the way, they're tearing down a couple of barns, um, which kind of bothers me um, because the, the pig barn is one of our favorite places to go uh, during the fair. Um, and um, I even knew a girl at Davis who lived in the pig barn at UC campus there in Davis. She, they had an apartment in the thing. It, it wasn't like she lived in the pig barn. but you know. so, so you're driving... And you drive past what we, what we call Our Lady of the Fairgrounds, which is the church out there. Um, and that's on the left. And then there's a cemetery, one of the great wondrous cemeteries in the, in the place. Cemeteries, I love cemeteries. Um, in fact, most of my ex-students, I had one of them come up to me one day and say, you know, we had spent so many lunch times in cemeteries that every time I go to one, I get hungry. Uh, <laughs> That was John Lane, by the way, and those, some of you know John Lane. So we're driving by the church there, and then there's the cemetery. Across the row in front, right in front, right on the highway, not facing away from the highway toward the center or something, but facing the highway are these incredible mausoleum crypt structures. It's all the Croatians. And it's like, we, they want to be seen, but they don't want to, you know, there's this contradiction. So a woman came into my class. She, she thinks it was 1980. I was like 12. She was 10. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and, and she was part of the reentry program, and, and, and she was one of the more senior people in that particular class. If, if I remember right. And I learned, I don't know how I found out, 
because her surname is not one of the ones that, tick, that, that tips you off, right? Um, it, she's not an itch. Okay. Um, see, there's a diversity that, that, that it be beyond anything you can imagine. And so I found out that she was, and that actually her dad didn't grow apples or touch apples or do anything with apples at all. He sold auto parts. What a, what a perfect spy. <laughs> to have her get into the community, they might even, you know, they probably know she is, but, but, but because he's from the auto parts store, he doesn't have any stories about the apples. So, so you know, we don't have to worry about her telling stories about the apples. Um, so I began to, I, I, pressure would, would be the word, right? Well, pressure the word. <laughs> I finally got to the point where I just, you know, I, every time I saw her, it's, you know, well, thanks. Oh, God. Now I'm 23 when I'm doing that. Okay, so she, <clears throat> but it seemed to me a perfect, and I didn't know Kathy at the time. I didn't realize that they were, you know, a pair and a team. And then she'd gotten involved with Morty Marcus, uh, Donna had, and M Morty provided a tremendous amount of help um, in, in this whole Balkan stuff, which still just drives me crazy. Um, so um, she finally, got... now Annie, my wife, who is pressuring me to finish, I don't know, what, five books? Are there four or five? How many? I don't know. Um, there's a, she, she uh, you know, maybe there's something I need to know about the pressure you need to know or something. But anyway, she sat down and, and the, the thing about the story, I came to this from, by ag. I grew up with ag. My dad was a farm advisor, but we lived in town in Hollister. We, I was a townie, um, but I had ag in my ear and I went to Davis and took ag history. Um, so ag was interesting to me, and one of the things I presumed in this story, the story, you see there, there's apples across the top of it, and apples are a big part of the theme. And I assumed, like people outside the community always did, that Croatia must be wall-to-wall -wall apple orchards. There must be just so damn many apples over there that, you know, that they just can't help themselves, that they come here and they just gotta plant them and grow them because then they eat them and, and they, you know, dry them. And drying was another angle that got me to them because they, most of the dryers were Chinese owned and operated. So the China dryers and I just knew, but, and then I find out, as they're starting to work, that no, no, there's no, there's a few apple orchards in uh, Croatia, but that's not part of the story. Um, what they did was they took the lump out of the, out of the egg econ economic cycle for apples. And I'm going to let them explain that to you, but that's what they did. It could have been asparagus. It could have been literally anything. They saw a niche, and they became so connected to it that they, it became synonymous. You said Slavonian, that meant apples. Now we know it isn't Slavonian, it's Croatian, and there's more to this story, and you're going to hear it, and I'm honored to be involved in this from the very beginning. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, George. Thank you, Sandy. Heartfelt introductions. And I suspect everyone in the room can tell George and Sandy have been seriously involved in this project from the beginning. Uh, thanks to Teresa Mora in the back. Um, she's head of special collections and archives at UC Santa Cruz. And um, Irina Polich, who 
is in Croatia right now. She's not here today. Um, she's with the Humanities Institute, and um, these guys invited us to speak today. Thanks to Marla Novo and the Ma, Rob, for hosting us. And this was set up to happen a couple of years ago, but COVID got in the way a couple of times. So it's really wonderful to be back inside the Ma today. It's been two years since we planned to do this. Um, a little plug here, for those of you who have not visited special collections at UCSC's McHenry Library, their archive is a, like an undiscovered treasure for the community. Um, it holds collections of m many um, local artists, music musicians, poets. Um, it includes the archive of Ansel Adams, the Grateful Dead, Lou Harrison, Bill Everson, and Donna's late husband, Morton Marcus. Something you should know about. Donna and I are granddaughters of Croatian immigrants from the Dubrovnik region. Our grandfather and grandmother um, immigrated directly into Watsonville in 1901 and 1914, respectively. Our father, Andrew Mekas, was born in Watsonville's Croatian colony on the corner of Ford and Rodriguez Street in 1920. The two of us were actually raised in Santa Cruz, but spent most Sundays with our grandparents and relatives in Watsonville. Croatian community. And we grew up thinking that everyone had family who spoke another language, frequently visited the ranches where people were sorting apples and cutting apricots in old wooden sheds, and ate foods with names like kupus and kubasica and pursuit and makarula. I see some nods in the audience. Yeah, we know those. Growing up in that world was the starting point for the story we'll be telling today. So we're going to have Donna begin with actual storytelling, and then we're going to switch back and forth. Good afternoon, everyone. After six years of research, Kathy and I wrote our book about the immigrants who came from the Dalmatian coast of Croatia to the Pajaro Valley. Through our research, we accessed over 200 so sources, both here and in Croatia, and interviewed over 30 senior members of Watsonville's Croatian community. Through this project, we learned of the significant confusion about who these people were, because they were commonly referred they, they referred to themselves as Slavonians in Watsonville rather than Yugoslavians or Croatians. And we learned about the influence they had in the, in, their, in the development of Santa Cruz County. We also became far more knowledgeable about the many different ethnic groups who originated or settled here, particularly in the South County, over the past 160 years. We began to understand how all of their differing worldviews, experiences, and visions contributed to this community. But today, we're focusing on just one of these groups, Watsonville's Croatians. How many of you are familiar with names like Alaga, Skuric, Letnic, Resitar, Marinovic, Kry, and Gizdic? <laughs> these are all quite common. These names are all quite common in the Pajaro Valley, and they're all Croatian names. How many of you know that in the 1920s and 30s, more than 20% of Watsonville's population was Croatian? Two of the most visible reminders of the influence the, that the Croatians had in the Pajaro Valley are on Watsonville's Main Street. This is the Letnich building. This is the building that Sandy just referred to. It's on the corner of Main and Beach Streets. It was built in 1914 by M.N. Letnich and his cousin Mateo, both from the region of Konavle, near the city of Dubrovnik in Croatia. Another landmark building, the Resitar Hotel, is on the corner of Main and West Lake. It was built in 1927 by three of the four Resitar brothers who came to Watsonville, also from Konavle. So who were these guys? 
And how is it that they came from Croatia to Watsonville? And where did they get the money to build these buildings? This is the story we're going to be telling you today. So we're starting with a map. Hopefully, we hope that most people in this room know where Croatia is today. But for those of you who don't, um, you can see on this map that it is directly um, just across from the boot of Italy. And I don't know if my pointer will work here, but it's, Dubrovnik is right here in the very, very southern tip, which is what we'll be talking about a lot today. Dubrovnik isn't just a city. It's a geographic region which surrounds the city. It's 75 miles long, 20 miles wide. It also includes the coastal islands along this portion of the Adriatic coast. And again, you can see Dubrovnik right here. And then also right just south is the area of Konavle. And we're going to be talking about that a lot today as well. I also just want to mention, um, given world politics, that right across that border is Bosnia-Herzegovina, and just south is Montenegro. The vast majority of Croatians who came to Watsonville came from this Dubrovnik region. We do think it's important to give you some historical background to better understand the later efforts of the Croatians in Watsonville. This is a 17th century painting of Dubrovnik. It shows you what the city would have looked like in the 1600s when it was an important international trading center and an independent city-state. The Dubrovnik Republic lasted for 700 years, from 1100 to 1808. And just think about that in comparison to the, you know, we, we're still under 250 here in the United States. So this is a 700 year long republic. This is Dubrovnik today. It doesn't look a lot different from that 17th century painting. This is a shot from the town walls looking down the main street. The main street there is called the Straden, and the Franciscan Monastery is this building right here on the left. Understanding Dubrovnik's relationship with Turkey and the Ottoman Empire is critical to understanding the Croatians' background in international shipping and trade. In 1373, Pope Gregory IX gave Dubrovnik permission to trade with the Ottoman Turks. At this time, other Christian countries, which included all of Europe, were not allowed to trade with the Muslim world. This trade agreement created a link between East and West, and Dubrovnik became a wealthy international trading center, where tradesmen honed their skills and were the middlemen delivering goods between the Western world and the Ottoman Empire. What you're looking at here is a rare photograph of the first demand for tribute from Mehmet II of the Ottoman Empire to Dubrovnik in the year 1458. This is just five years after the fall of Constantinople. And I'm just going to insert here that, you know, one of the thrilling things about working on a project like this is being able to go into the Dubrovnik archives and they show you everything. You know, you're wearing white gloves and you get to go in and they really show you all the original documents. And I remember saying, can I take a photograph? And they said, of course. So, you know, I'm walking out with these documents that really haven't even been published before. So it's, it's, uh, you know, this piece is very personally interesting to me because of all of that history. Dubrovnik's international shipping fleet boasted 300 ships in the 1500s rivaling Venice in shipping throughout Europe. 18 of their ships were part of the Spanish Armada. Between 1200 and 1800, for 600 years, Dubrovnik was a very diverse cosmopolitan port city. There were people doing business from all over the world and speaking many languages. In his play Twelfth Night, Shakespeare describes Dubrov Dubrovnik as the ideal city-state. Most of Watsonville's Croatians came from the rural areas and the islands of the Dubrovnik Republic. The majority came from the southern region of Konavle. This is what Konavle looks like today. I was just in that spot four weeks ago, <laughs> right there. This is a painting dated around 1900 showing people from Konavle wearing their traditional dress, just like the one that we have here today. They're dancing the kolo, a Croatian round dance. This is a traditional family house in Konavle. This is the Bonnets house. Uh, this photo was taken in 1954. I want you to notice how big this house is. 
One of the unique cultural traits of this area was that the rural people had for centuries lived in large family compounds called zajednice. These compounds included up to 30 family members where there were very strict roles for each individual's responsibilities and behavior. These large family units had organized for survival and they worked together as a single social unit. The Zajednice would prove to be extremely important for the Croatians' economic success in the Pajaro Valley. In 1808, this republic, with all of its government, laws, and history, came to an end. Napoleon's troops, as part of his invasion of European countries, enter Dubrovnik, take over the city, and destroy the republic, similar to the horror we're witnessing today in Ukraine. Then, fast forward, just 42 years from 1808 to 1850, the Republic is, dis is demolished, their shipping trade is destroyed, the shipbuilders on the islands and the farmers in the countryside were starving to death. People he heard news of gold in California. Hundreds of boys and young men began migrating to California, most between the ages of 16 and 20, and they spoke no English. More than half of the young male population from the villages of the Dubrovnik region immigrated to America, with many settling in the Pajaro Valley. And I'm gonna say that one more time because it's a very important thing. If you can just imagine for a moment what it would be like for us to say more than half of their young male population left. It's dramatic um, for, for those who came here, but also for those that they left. Here are some who left. These are men from the Oliga family in 1905. They're from the village of Bonny in Kornavli. Seven of them would leave for Watsonville. And this is one who was left behind. This is Antun Resitar from Chilipi, Kornavli. Four of his sons would leave for Watsonville and later build the Resitar Hotel on Main Street. This is Ivo Skurich on the left with two friends. There were, four, there, there, there were 12 siblings in the Skurich family, and eight of them came to Watsonville. Evil was one of the Skurich brothers who stayed in Croatia. Here's a shot of immigrants leaving from Kolacep, an island just off Dubrovnik, in 1910, and they are heading for America. Like everyone else, the Croatians came to California in large numbers with the gold rush. This is a shot of a San Francisco harbor in 1851. By this time, there's a small Croatian community in San Francisco on Davis Street. These early immigrants arrived from Europe by ship traveling around the Horn of South America. But by 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was connected from the East Coast to California so it became far easier to cross the country. By 1870, there are 250 Croatians living in San Francisco. Some Croatian men found work in the mines, but far more found opportunities in service industries where they formed partnerships and worked in groups. They worked in the restaurant industry, in coffee houses, and as fruit, mer fruit merchants. Some of you may be familiar with one of these early San Francisco Croatians. This is John Tadic. He was one of the early owners of the historic Tadic Grill restaurant, the oldest surviving restaurant in San Francisco today. In 1871, Tadic traveled from the island of Var to Croatia, uh, in Croatia, to New York. He then rode the Transcontinental Railroad from New York to California, less than two years after its opening. This is what he said about this trip. We have this great quote of him writing later in his life about coming across the country. So this quote is coming from the 19th century. I shall never forget the beautiful scenery, and I'm happy that I had the opportunity to see the country as it was then. I can never again see those wonderful sights under the same conditions, and I feel it was a great privilege. I recall now when, that whenever our train would stop on a sidetrack, Hundreds of Indians, including women with papoose, papooses on their backs, would gather around the train. They were just as curious about us as we were about them. Another interesting thing to me was my first sight of a group of Chinese. 
They had on large sun hats and were repairing the railroad bed. The sight of the Indians and the Chinese made a lasting impression, and I enjoy the recollection to this day. Two other extremely entrepreneurial Croatians who lived in this early San Francisco colony were Marko Rabasa and Luke Srezovic. This is a photo of Luke. We don't have a photo of Marko. We wish someday we would find one. They had both experienced San Francisco's economic explosion in the late 1860s. By 1876, Marko Rabasa and Luke Srezovic are doing business in Watsonville. This is what Watsonville would have looked like to them at the time they arrived. When they first arrived, there were already 47,000 fruit trees in Santa Cruz County. But 15 years later, by 1891, there would be 307,000. Kathy will explain how this came about. As Donna explained, Croatians by tradition had been international traders. The Croatians who immigrated to California in the wake of the gold rush held on to that heritage as traders. And rather than heading to the gold fields, they were much more likely to find opportunity by trading. Providing goods and services to San Francisco became their mark. In San Francisco, 18 of the early 29 coffee houses and saloons were Croatian owned. Another of these Croatian dominated services was bringing fresh produce into the city. By the mid 1870s, the need to provide San Francisco with goods reaches, this is, this is San Francisco. Oh, I, I wanted to mention San Francisco between 18, uh, 60 and the end of the 1870s grows from 50,000 people to 250,000 people. So you have a sense of this burgeoning city, and, and they're trying to provide services. So here we're, we're, we get to the mid-1870s, and this is Watsonville, and this is a, a fun slide, not only because it's colored, but because those of you who are familiar with downtown Watsonville will recognize a building that's still there. Um, by the 1870s, uh, the great tracts of the Mexican land grants that were purchased in the 1860s are planted in grain crops. Watsonville's population had grown from about 50 in the time of the ranchos to maybe 200. Um, no fresh produce is being sent out of Santa Cruz County. Grain is coming out, but there's nothing fresh. The first Croatian immigrant to deal in fresh produce in Watsonville was Marco Rabasa. He'd been brokering fruit into San Francisco that he had purchased in San Jose. In 1873, Red Scale wiped out hundreds of thousands of newly planted fruit trees in the Santa, Cru Santa Clara Valley. So Rabasa, like the man in this wagon, drove a little farther. He drives beyond Santa Clara into the Pajaro Valley, and he proceeded to collect fruit from family orchards that he transported by wagon load, just like this, back to San, back to San Francisco. His business over the next couple of years sets the tradition in the Pajaro Valley. Growers don't look for distributors. It's the distributor who looks for expansion among the growers. It's the opposite of what happened in most farm communities of the era. The early distributors discovered if they promised to purchase all the fruit in an orchard, the family farmer would have enough security and financial incentive to plant more orchards. Pre-purchase contracts had been used for non-perishables like sugar beets and grain, but it appears the Croatian distributors are the first to offer a specific purchase price for apples, and it's based on the health of the orchard and the number of blossoms on the trees. Um, take a look at the, the guy in this orchard. This, this isn't the farmer. 
This is the business guy. He's looking at what those trees look like so that he can offer a price before there's ever fruit. This type of future contract is called a blossom contract. An even riskier practice emerged. A promise to pay a specified price for eight years based on one year's blossoms. <laughs> That's what Marco Robisa does. The late 19th century Pajaronian newspaper editorials, they make fun. They make it clear that they thought this practice is just crazy. And by the reaction here, you wouldn't find anybody today who's going to offer you a price for eight years out. Um, but orchards and production expanded rapidly based on the security of blossom contracts offered by these immigrant businessmen. Um, they took this risk because of their desire to succeed in this country and because they saw the possibilities that were opening in the Pajaro Valley. By the mid-1880s, the scale of fruit shipments being sent to San Francisco by Rabasa and Srezovic attracted even more Croatian fruit merchants to Watsonville. Some who came in this mid-1880 time frame are M.N. Letnic, F.P. Marinovic, Luke and Stephen Scourge. Their families are still here today. Many of you know them. The growth in the apple harvest also encouraged Luke Srezovic to set up the first on-site packing house in Watsonville in 1884. The Croatian distributors knew that back home, all but their share of the crop grown in their family fields had been taken by their landowner by their landowner, and shipped to nearby countries. They already took working on an international scale for granted. This was a different perspective than that held by the early local farmers. What California offered these immigrants was more financial incentive and fewer restrictions on land ownership. Here, you could own your own land and make a profit. The Croatians were still wary, though. Because of politics in the homeland, they never lost their fear that government would confiscate either their land or their business, or both. And that's also part of the reason that people didn't talk to Sandy. <laughs> As orchard production grew, there was more demand for labor. This took place just as Chinese immigration was restricted by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So here we have a group of Chinese working on the rail bed, and um, they moved into agricultural labor when the railroad was finished. Um, but very quickly, their numbers were restricted. As a result, Croatian brokers began recruiting newly arrived laborers from the Croatian community in San Francisco that they were connected with. We have a group of them here, and these laborers quickly learned that a single man living frugally could save enough in two years to lease his own 10 acres. And in two more, he could either own his own small packing business or purchase that small plot of land he had leased two years earlier. And this was a huge incentive for young men from a country where, for centuries, the purchase of land for all but the noble class had been prevented by law. Oh, a postcard. Postcards and letters were constantly going back and forth between the Dubrovnik region and Watsonville. And as orchards were expanding further, more labor beyond what was available in San Francisco was needed to take care of increased crops. So the letters back to Croatia described possibilities for work with a future in Watsonville. 
Offering extended family and neighbors from the old country a job became a common practice. The job offers then came with paid passage. So this is another boat um, on the, uh, the dock at Kolachep, and it moves on uh, to probably Trieste and then on to this country with a job offer in hand. This is Luke Sikuth and his family. It's, um, he became a prominent grower in the Pajaro Valley, and it's about 15 years after his arrival here. And in a wonderful interview held by the archives at UCSC, um, he talks about his youth in Konavli. I heard about California. That was all you heard about back home. Families were always riding back and forth. As far as the United States, we hardly ever thought about it. But California was always on our minds. By 1889, there were four small packing businesses in Watsonville. And this is an early Oliga packing house. Then there were nine. This is a this is a Stolich family packing little packing operation. Then there were thirty. Then there were fifty. More than eighty Croatian families involved in apple packing businesses in the decade that followed. The Croatian contribution to the development of agriculture in the Pajaro Valley had three parts. The brokers arranged pre-purchase contracts for fresh produce that encouraged the growth. The new immigrants provided a labor force to keep up with agricultural growth. Next, they developed a vertical production chain. One of the unique cultural traits of the immigrants from the Dubrovnik region was that for centuries, people from the rural areas lived in large, structured family communities that Donna described as Zajenice. In Watsonville, Croatian apple-growing families were following a custom. They were following a structure that came naturally to them. I like this picture of the Stolich family and Packers because you know that everyone there had a job. Grandma had a job. The kids had a job. The Croatian came, Croatians came from a culture in which 20 or more extended family members at a time regularly organized into production chains to carry out all of the steps needed to reach their common goals. The Croatians in Watsonville organized into working groups to perform every job necessary to develop a vertical production chain for fresh produce, from growing to picking to the packing that we see here in the family. So somebody's going to be doing the transporting. This is um, Joe Boric in, in this picture. Somebody's going to be doing the sorting. This is the Rilovich family um, at work. There was marketing for a presentation that somebody was in charge of, and this is a, a Stolich family photo from a fair. Um, there was marketing for brand recognition, and this is an Apple label. This happens to be our grandfather's Apple label. And there are so many of these Apple labels in Watsonville because that was how you established brand recognition at the time. So from the late 1880s to the mid-1920s, each year brought new arrivals from Croatia. Oh, we forgot one of our photos. This is, this is loading a train um, for international uh, shipping. Uh, Stephen Knego. Um, so now, as, as, as each year, the previous year's new arrivals start new businesses, like uh, um, the Vahutin and uh, Vojvodic family here. By the time direct immigration to Watsonville was in full force, the Croatian brokers 
offered even more services to growers. They're offering front money to new Croatian farmers to get started, as well as supplying maintenance and picking crews for families who haven't brought in their extended family yet. Brokers had become the informal bankers, what we now call venture capitalists. The packing houses became larger. Remember the first packing house picture I show you? This is uh, a few years later. This is the Alaga Brothers packing house. Now they're consolidating other growers' fruit with their own, and they build right next to the railroad tracks. Let me just point out down here in the bottom. That's, that's a rail track. And that was important because fruit could be brought in on Tuesday, and it could be um, cleaned and boxed, and there would be a rail car sitting right there, and it would be put in the rail car. So we're talking tree to train within 24 hours. The Pajaro Valley is perhaps the first industrial countryside in America where fro fresh produce is handled in this step-by-step -step fashion for distant national and international distribution. Now I have a later picture. This is um, in the 19, about 1930. We've even got a vehicle there. Um, it's Walker and Beach Street. And it's interesting to note a practice that persisted from the 1890s. Although the various Croatian families competed with each other, they still set up operations right next door to each other. So that in this photo, you've, you've got, um, I've got here, Stolich, Jupan, Barina, the family that's on the front of the poster here, uh, in the front of our book, uh, Skurich, Jornic, Kalic, uh, Lukrich, Letnich, uh, Dragovic, Brajkovic, just all set up. These, these are competitors all set up right next door to each other. And in this row of packing houses, the rail cars were on the backside. And, and the rail cars each evening would be set behind each person's business, and each of them are filling those cars ready to head out in the morning. Croatians had written purchase contracts to get the apple industry started. They were successful at bringing in their extended family as a labor force. They had also succeeded in putting into place all the labor-intensive steps necessary to quickly send their fruit out of the area. But what they couldn't do was solve the problem of insect damage. It destroyed nearly 50% of the crop an annually. They tried tar and whale oil soap and elixirs that burned the leaves off of the trees. It would be this student entomologist, William Volk, and his counterpart, E.E. E. Luther, who came on loan from UC Davis to do this job. And this lab, um, the building is still there. It's across the street from um, Watsonville High School. It would take these guys years, but they would develop a compound and a system that was effective yet gentle, and it could be routinely sprayed. The outcome for Volk and Luther and a handful of Watsonville financial backers was the development of the Ortho brand in Watsonville. Before pest control, the Croatians were able to increase production of fruit in the Pajaro Valley 40 or 50 fold by the turn of the century. Up to 500,000 boxes of apples shipped annually in 1898. By 1903, at the dawn of pest control, they were shipping 2,500,000 boxes from a town of 2,500 people. <laughs> apples, and then every year it, it increased. Apples became such a huge business in Watsonville by 1909 that local businessmen decided to organize an annual fair called the Apple Annual. 
It was modeled on exhibits they'd seen at the 1894 San Francisco World Fair and Exhibition. This is an Apple Annual Parade photo. Um, this photo was taken on Main Street for the parade. Um, but it mirrors just a portion of the stream of apple wagons that rumbled down Walker Street all day long during the harvest season. Special buildings were built for the fair. Thousands from, of people from all over the country arrived in Watsonville by trainload. And let me show you a couple things on this slide. So this is the... This is the whole world made out of apples. This is the old Watsonville High School. And if you seat yourself here in one of the chairs, you have a sense of the, the scope of this building that they built just for this event. The economic outcome of this story has become famous through Jack London's description um, that George introduced you to earlier today. He talks about the Slavonian apple growers of the Pajaro Valley in his 1913 novel, The Valley of the Moon. In the novel, a farmer named Benson is talking to a young married couple he's picked up in his wagon on his way to Watsonville. Uh, this is the Hecker Pass overlook, which some of you will recognize, although it's busier these days. But um, um, this is where he is when, when um, this excerpt takes place. He's marveling at the accomplishment of the Croatians, while at the same time taking it for granted that Croatian immigrants are inferior to Americans. Benson says, wait till we strike the Pajaro Valley. I'll show you what can be done with the soil by uneducated foreigners that the high and mighty American has always sneered at. I'll show you it's one of the most wonderful demonstrations in this state. Think of it, 12,000 acres of apples. Do you know what they call the Pajaro Valley now? New Dalmatia. They were miserable immigrants. First, they worked at day labor in the fruit harvest Next, they began in a small way, buying the apples on the trees. The more money they made, the bigger became their deals. Pretty soon, they were renting the orchards on long leases, and now they're beginning to buy the land. It won't be long before they own the whole valley and the last American will be gone. <laughs> These Adriatic Slavs are long-headed in business. Not only can they grow apples, but they can sell apples. No market. What does it matter? Make a market. That's their way. While our kind let the crops rot knee-deep under the trees, why those Dalmatians are showing Pajaro apples on the South African market right now. <laughs> There's the valley now. Look at those trees, look at those hillsides, that's New Dalmatia, an apple paradise. The Croatian apple industry was a dominant player in the national market into the 1930s and still a strong player in the 60s when Donna and I played on Sundays at family farmhouses among the apple orchards. But Decades before that, already by 1890, apple districts in Oregon, Washington, and eight other states began distributing their products nationally using the vertical methodology pioneered by Pajaro Valley Croatians. I want to share. This is a later slide. This is a Resitar packing house in the 1930s, and I like it because we now have conveyor belts to add to our vertical list of jobs that the community is doing. As the Croatian apple industry reached its peak between the two world wars, experimentation had begun in other but related work fields. They had already been producing and distributing crops other than apples. 
the next generation easily moved into real estate, banking, insurance, trucking, cold storage, packaging, and the provision of agricultural supplies. And now I'd like to pass back to Donna, and she's going to tell you what daily life was like for these Croatian immigrants and how they maintain their cultural identity while simultaneously integrating into life in Watsonville and Santa Cruz County. How's everybody doing? Great. We doing okay? So what was life like for these early Croatians? Even though some Croatian immigrants were financially successful in Watsonville's early years, like Mateo Letnic here, there were far more who worked for the wealthier Croatian families as laborers and scraped by as best they could, like the laborers in this photo. For those working in the apple industry in the early days, the work was long and hard. Everyone was up at 5 a.m. to begin their day pruning and spraying the apple trees. At that time, mustard plants grew tall underneath the apple trees, and the yellow foliage would be wet with fog or rain in the mornings. As a result, the pant legs of the orchardist's trousers would be soaked, and they would remain wet all day. Many of the men developed arthritis in their knees and ankles early on from working in these conditions. The men would also come home from work covered with yellow dust from toxic pesticides they were using to spray the trees. The jobs in the packing sheds were no easier. Women did most of the sorting, the sheds were not heated, and the work was monotonous and unending. The women would heat bricks in their ovens at home and take them to work in the mornings. They would then stand on the bricks for warmth while they worked. This is a map showing where many of Watsonville's Croatians lived. We refer to this as the Croatian colony. It expanded around the railroad tracks and the apple packing sheds. And so I'm going to just, I know you can't hear me so well, but this, if you all take a look, this is Main Street, the Main Street of Watsonville. St. Patrick's Church is right here. And then the Croatian colony really runs forward, down Rodriguez, down the first, and up Walker. And of course, Walker is right on the tracks. So that, that, um, just, just to comment on that, at one point when my dad was still alive, Kathy and I went with him, and he was able to tell us the names of every family in every home in that area um, who was there in the 1920s and the 1930s, and it was all Croatian. Here's a photo of the Walker Street train depot, which is still there today, as we are all aware because of local train politics. And this is Walker Street between Westlake and West Beach, showing the Railroad Exchange Hotel on the right. The Croatian Strazicic family originally owned this entire block. The advantage of living so close together was that it facilitated the continual social visiting that was a part of Croatian culture in the old country and continued here in Watsonville. Those growing up in this community were pretty self-sufficient. They all grew their own gardens, they raised chickens, and rabbits, and they often had a goat or a pig. But this same closeness is also why everyone knew everyone else's business. So keeping your good name became essential. These are three brothers. These are the Miljanic brothers. This is Peter, Paul, and George. Um, and George is on the far right, and he was a colleague of Sandy's and mine at Cabrillo College. And we interviewed him, and he had this great story to tell us about this idea of reputation. So this is his quote. When I was a kid, my father used to say, if you got your name in the paper because you've done something bad, you'll find your suitcase waiting for you on the front porch. In the Croatian community, your reputation was everything. But as a kid, I kept thinking, we're so poor, we don't even own a suitcase. <laughs> Where are my parents going to get this suitcase if I were to get into trouble? Very, very much George's sense of humor for anybody who knows him. Now, moving on to a story about Watsonville's plaza on Main Street. 
This is an early slide of the plaza. It's about 1900. The person who took this photo is standing in the plaza looking at East Beach Street directly ahead with Main Street to the left. One of the people that we interviewed before she passed away in 2004 was Mary Ferris. Mary was the granddaughter of Luke Skurich, one of Watsonville's earliest and most highly regarded Croatian immigrants. Mary remembered spending time with her grandfather when she was young and told us the following story. So this is a quote from Mary. In the early 1930s, when I was about four, my grandfather and I would frequently walk together from our home to the plaza on Main Street. We would spend time sitting together on a bench in the park, and my grandfather would take the time to point out all the languages we could hear from where we were sitting. He would identify English, Croatian, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, and Japanese. My grandfather would identify the languages for me and have me listen so that I too would learn and hear the uniqueness of these languages. So as I don't even think I need to drill this in, but the point of this, think about the diversity historically in the town of Watsonville. It has always been an extremely diverse town from the very, very beginning. And this, to me, this is a beautiful story that reflects that. Continuing on this theme of diversity, this is a photo that shows Japanese and Croatian Packers in 1911. Um, Mitchell Kalich is the man standing, where's my, here, he's what, the one with the hat on, I think over here. He's got two kids. Um, he's holding the hands of his children, Lucille and Louie, who's standing on an apple box. And you see a large number of Japanese and Croatian Packers. Through our research, we learned that this wasn't solely a working relationship because 34 years later, during World War II, the Croatian Kalich family would travel all the way to Poston, Arizona to visit the Japanese Yagi family at the internment camp where they had been relocated throughout the war. The Kalich family was also one of the Watsonville families who assisted their Japanese neighbors when they returned to the Pajaro Valley. As we know, this was not always the case. Finally, I want to show you a few photos that will give you a glimpse into the cultural life of these immigrants. This is the wedding of Louis Secondo and Mary Yerenich. It's 1914, and this is a packing house wedding, and we refer to these as packing house weddings. So I'm going to come over again. You might not be able to hear me so well. I don't know. Um, should I just turn this around? I don't know. I don't know if that's going to really help. It's kind of... So, if you can imagine, this is the packing house where everyone was, was working the day before. And if you look in the back, it's filled with all the apple boxes that were just moved and stacked up against the wall back here. And then take a look at what they're sitting on. They're sitting on apple boxes turned on their heads with redwood planks going across the top. And the tables are made the same way. There's three apple boxes to each pillar. Um, with a plank, and then they put up streamers and they have a wedding for hundreds. This was the norm. A little less expensive than weddings today. <laughs> this is another packing house wedding photo of Peter Stolich and Helen Pekrovich, also in 1914. And on this one, note the Croatian embroidery on the bottom of the tablecloth, you know, kind of similar to what we brought in on our tablecloth today. And we know that all of those bottles of wine would have been homemade because everybody made their own wine in this community. Watsonville's Croatians maintained a strong sense of their own community and culture. They always turned out for weddings, funerals, and any chance for a social gathering. And they still do today, by the way. This is a weekend gathering at the Copra Vises on San Juan Road. It's the 1920s. And this is a photo that we both love because this man right here is our great uncle, Andro, and this is our great uncle, Nick, the one that's seated playing. He's playing a traditional handmade instrument from Konable called the guzla. Um, this man, you also might know, um, he is Nita Gistich's father. Um, for those of you who know Gistich Ranch and know Nita, this is Nita's dad, Nick, um, and he was our great uncle. This is a Croatian um, beach barbecue in the 1920s. Croatians worked hard, but they always had time for a barbecue. And this is a photo of a group of Croatian men barbecuing meat over an open fire down by the beach. Meat is definitely a mainstay of the Croatian diet. And we are guessing this is goat or lamb. 
This is the backyard um, of the Bubich House on Ford Street in 1928. This is a photo that Kathy and I are particularly fond of because it includes all of our family. Um, I don't know if I can really do it from here, but let's see if I can. This is grandfather Marco right here, grandmother Kate. This is my dad, our dad Andy, Andy Meckes, and his sister Helen that's got her hand up over her face and Uncle Nick over in the corner. Um, we've been able to identify all but one person in this photo. So we've, we, have it, we have all of this completely labeled with who was there. This is the Miramar Bar. Um, it was at 526 Main Street in Watsonville. It opened in 1947 by three partners, Nick Durpich, Clem Ivlich, and Blondie Lusic. It was a Croatian hangout for more than 40 years into the 1990s. So this shows you kind of coming into today. You know, we're getting, it, you know, it, it really is, has continued to be an ongoing community. And then after 48 years of steady immigration, from the Dubrovnik region to the Pajaro Valley, Croatian immigration was virtually stopped in 1924. This took place as a result of the National or Origins Quota Act, which ended most immigration to the United States from the area of today's Croatia. Croatian immigrants, immigration was stopped because of anti-immigrant sentiments, particularly towards groups coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. By this time, immigration had already been stopped for immigrants coming from Asia. One of the leaders of this movement was Francis Walker, a former president of MIT. What he said in an 1896 essay gives you a glimpse of what anti-immigration leaders were saying publicly about immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. So I'm gonna read you a, another quote. This is a quote, quote from Francis Walker, 1896. The entrance into our political, social, and industrial life of such vast masses of peasantry, degraded below our utmost conceptions, is a matter which no intelligent patriot can look upon without the gravest apprehension and alarm. They are beaten men from beaten races, representing the worst failures in the struggle for existence. What effects must be produced upon our social standards and upon the ambitions and aspirations of our people by a content so foul and loathsome. Francis Walker's sentiments were eventually successful in all but stopping immigration from areas of Southern and Eastern Europe. In closing, the Croatians were just one of the many immigrant groups who found a new life in America and have contributed to our nation's growth. All of the immigrant groups who have come to work in the Pajaro Valley have had a tremendous impact on the culture and economy of Santa Cruz County. It's this mix of histories, experiences, and cultures that continues to be our uniqueness, our struggle, and our advantage. With that, thank you. We are, we are going to, a couple things are going to happen here. Of course, Kathy and I will be selling books and signing them for those of you who would like to buy one. Um, but before we even get there, we would love to have a little, you know, questions, discussion. And I know that Sandy and George would be happy to join us in kind of answering questions as well. So we, we are actually scheduled to be in this room for another over half an hour. So if we want, so people that want to um, ask questions, it's time. Annie. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, one, the large household in the old country, um, so many people, when someone got married, was it the woman who moved into her husband's house or vice yes. versa? Or... Yes. The woman, woman leaves her family home and moves into her husband's house. And she hopes that it'll be a situation where she'll at least be able to visit her birth family. Not, it, it, it isn't always that way. Yeah. yeah. Actually just can't take this out. Maybe, maybe that's what we do. What happens to a household that has no sons? Ooh. What happens is you adopt or recruit a young man who takes the women's family name to become so a little different than, than in this country. So he, he takes the name. The name goes with the house. And if there's no male heirs, um, you bring somebody in to take the name of the house. So it's kind of not like a combined, like let's say the wife has a brother, he doesn't move into the house. He starts his own family. 
Yes. 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 And it's a, a primogenitor system. So if you're not the oldest brother, if you're not going to inherit, um, from the time you can sit at the table, you're talking about, oh, maybe you'd like to go do that. There's an assumption that you're leaving. Now, you, you can be brought in by your older brother and, and, and be part of the a family, Zayanitsa, in the, nec in the next generation, and that happens to probably 50% of younger brothers. But um, if you've got kind of a, a wish to do something else, that entrepreneurial look at, oh, you could go be a sailor. Oh, you could, you could go do something else because its oldest brother ha inherits everything. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question way back in the back. Is that still true? Um, it is definitely changing, but it's it's still it's sort of it's there and it's changing. Uh, it, I would say the answer is both. If you happen to have a very strict father, that father might still be kind of trying to push that, and then very often the mother's going, "No, we should be changing with the times a little bit." And I, I mean, that really is kind of the way it goes. So it's changing, but it's just recently changing. Like if you know, if you go back fifty years, it wasn't changing. Our family house. So yeah, our yeah, we have a we have a family house um, over there that's been in our family since 1300, um, and it's the Mekas family has consistently lived in that house since the 1300s, and what we know now is that the daughter that's now in her 60s has been upset all of her life because she didn't inherit any property. It went to her brother. So it's, it, it's creating a lot of strain, you know, between the, you know, the modern way of doing things versus the traditional way of doing things. Yeah. What was their um, feeling about educating their children? And how, how far did they inherit their children? Well, probably both want to respond to that. Um, I, I, I would start, you, you're talking about in Croatia or here? Because the answer is different. In Croatia, our grandparents were not educated beyond the fourth grade. Um, that was pretty normal. Um, and if you were from a wealthy family, you might get sent to Dubrovnik and study under Italian teachers, but only if you had money. That wasn't the average peasant family. Um, so about fourth grade is where is where it was. When they came to Watsonville, um, it's really interesting. When we interviewed people and talked to them about education, some families, like, you know, for those of you who knew Ann Soldo, and of course I know Sandy did, you know, like there were certain people, like she went to Stanford, the Barinas went to Stanford, um, the Miljaniches all went to Berkeley. I was going to say June Barina in this picture became the first female, um, called district attorney, yeah, district, district attorney, attorney for the state of California. So they're another Stanford graduate. But, but not, that's kind of the exceptions. It, it, those are the exceptions. The universals were um, to expect your sons to um, finish high school and start a business, run a business. Uh, for most families, daughters weren't, the, the value of education was not um, very important for daughters. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but did they plant the apple tree or were apples already growing there? I'm going to let you answer. Okay. Um, there were family orchards. Let's say you have planted wheat on this huge amount of land that you have bought that used to be a Spanish rancho. And then you have your household family. And so you do have, you've got three apple trees and a plum tree. And um, you, you, so there's, it's not that there were no apples growing here. There were not um, commercial orchard. Um, the Blackburn orchard had, um, was an actual orchard with enough fruit trees in it that some fruit was sold to local markets. But that, that was not the focus at all. So when Marco Robisa comes to the Pajaro Valley, he's shopping around from family to family going, can, can, maybe I can get a few boxes from here. Maybe I can get a few boxes there. So they existed, but not for commercial operation. Yeah. Um, what about the role of the church in Watsonville in their lives? Mm. <laughs> um, 99% Roman Catholic. 
Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, so th those of you that don't know about the Balkans, as Sandy was talking about, so much of the conflict in the Balkans is over religion. I mean, that really is the conflict. And the, um, the Serbs and the Montenegrins are all Orthodox Christian. The Croatians are Roman Catholic. Um, the Bosnians are Muslim, um, by mostly, although there's, that's a much more complicated story. Um, and it, it's, it's all of these wars that keep happening and the breakup, the key, it's really about religion. And so when they came to, you know, to Watsonville, they all came, they're all Catholic. And they got along just fine with the Irish, right? I mean, Sandy has talked about this before, is that the, the early immigrants to Watsonville were pretty much all Roman Catholic. I mean, the Spanish, the Irish, the Croatians, the Portuguese, right? You know, I mean, so they're all, not all, but, but many. Um, and so, yeah, the, the Catholic Church was... Our grandmother used to... They lived down the street from St. Patrick's, our, our grandparents. And I remember times staying with my grandmother when I was, you know, eight years old. And she was always walking down and putting coins and lighting candles, and you know, I mean, the, you know, the, the community was very, very involved. So the weddings would have all taken place at the Catholic Church. Either the Saint, Church. either Saint uh, Patrick's or the Valley Catholic, one of the two. Yeah. You might have said this, but why Watsonville? What was the lure that Watsonville had versus Salinas versus the Central Valley. What started it all? Because Marco Rabasa couldn't find any fruit to take to San Francisco in Santa. San Jose or Santa Clara after it had completely been wiped out by insect damage. He just took the road a little farther and he found something that he could carry by wagon back to San Francisco. And so th the story is, oh, I've discovered a place that I can, I can take it back to San Francisco, and the soil's really good here. Let me call some guys and see if we can't, maybe, maybe a few years from now, I can be taken more back to San Francisco. It's, it's the, the luck of the placement near San Francisco. Um, and it's a day's wagon ride uh, away. I mean, it, the train comes and plays a part as we get farther along in this story. The, the train will come play a part, but that's, that's the first answer to your question. Tring, Tring's got uh, Okay, Tring. I, I love the story about the, um, uh, the pesticide development. Yeah. But, but tell us, did you find more about them creating new strains of apples by mixing, and did they get into that more? Like, like grafting? Is that, is, that, is that what you mean? Uh, there's definitely grafting going on. As, as a matter of fact, one of the, the uh, oh, there's a, the slide of the broker in the fields. There's a poster of it over there. Look at the size of those um, apple trees. Um, that's not what you see today because you learn you want to be able to reach them to pick them. And so, um, so you have that change going on, but you also have a really other interesting change going on. Once you can reach Eastern markets, there's a development of how uh, fruit is sold in the East. And when it hits the point that all the fruit is brought into a, what was called an auction house, you're looking at those, uh, crates of, of fruit, and the ones that look the best are the ones that Safeway is going to pay more for. And so fruit that looks good and ships well becomes way more important than fruit that tastes good, unfortunately. And, and we all know there's heritage trees, and there's, there's, there are banks of heritage trees, but yes, they changed crops for marketability, that's really true. Yes. Can you mention something about Slavonians? They were called Slavonians at one time. I had, I had a relative that referred to herself as a Slavonian. So the, this group of people, this group of, I'm going to try to do this as simply as I can. This group of people, when they first arrived here, they were under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, okay? But they didn't 
they were not Austrian, they were not Hungarian, and they knew they weren't, and they didn't identify at all as being Austrian or Hungarian. They knew that they were Slavic. And the term, it just became kind of a slang term of calling themselves Slavs or Slavonians because it was, I'm not Austrian or Hungarian. And so, and then also we found out in our, in our research that in Italy for years, I mean for hundreds of years, the Italians called them the Schiavoni, which means Slavonians. They were called that by the Italians. So it's, there's kind of a history of, it's more of a, an, you know, they would call it an ethnic term. They're calling themselves Slavic as opposed to being connected to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And, and, and another example, I, I, I think immigrant groups often will throw up um, a, a screen to make it easy. Um, and and the, one of the best examples that I can think of is, uh, is the um, Azorians. Uh, almost all the immigrants um, who were from what politically was um, Portugal are from the Azores. And it, 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 when you talk to somebody from outside California and, and you say, where are you from? And you say, Aptos, well, okay, that, that you're dead. Uh, because then you have to, in other words, each immigrant group puts up something that will um, make it easier, and so the Azorians all said they were Portuguese. Well, but if you talk to an Azorian, that's the last thing they want to say they are, um, because they've been trying to break away from Portugal for centuries, um, and they're they are very feisty about it. But I think that Slavonian became a kind of catch-all. Um, for the outside world, and not that they were obscuring something, but once again, you see the complication in the map. But I think that, um, so you have a, an organization in the Pajaro Valley where you are organized, it's called Yako, and, and that stands... Sako now. Sako now, but it was Yako. It oh, there, there, see, now? Uh, all right, try to keep up, right? And it was called Yako because it was? Slavian American cultural organization, and now it's Slavic American cultural organization. But they also arrived, these early immigrants arrived before it was Yugoslavia. So they also didn't really identify with that either because they were here before that period of time. And so, you know, I think, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, when our book came out, it had just become Croatia. I mean, it really had all just happened. And I think that some of the old timers in Watson were a little bit like, uh, I guess we're being called Croatians, you know? <laughs> and I think that now they all know. They all know that that, that is who they are. But I, it was interesting. That our, I mean, our, our book was kind of like right when it was changing is when our, and we chose to say, to call them the Croatians because we knew that that's what was happening um, politically in the world. Diana, Kathy, it's because you made the book. <laughs> Look at the maps and everything. I said, this is the book. Yeah. We, we, we've been we've been told we've been told okay this sounds a little bit uh, you know but we've been told that people at the Croatians in Watsonville call this the book <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I want to add to that when we collected the stories it wasn't this person's story and that person's story all of a sudden it became obvious this backstory this cultural story and no one knew their own Story. Backstory, yeah. and so that that was the piece that was so interesting to to the people going that would say, "Oh, that's why my grandpa said that," yes. or "Oh, that's why we did this." Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. know their it, own. And, and think think about you know when we used to ask old timers, our you know our father or grandfather, you know what was it like back in the old country, which is what you'd say. The answer was always, oh, it's you know rocks and sticks. You wouldn't want to go. If well, you know, of course, you know here we're talking about this glorious history. I mean that was I mean this is a major international trading center, but they didn't really know. So you know it's yeah trying to put that change into people understanding their own their own history. So every immigrant group has diversity 
within it, which unless you're close to it, you don't know it and you don't see it. Um, and, and my Chinese, um, you know, if, if you go, go to the university and study Mandarin and then you want to talk to the overseas Chinese, you won't be able to talk to anybody because they all speak Cantonese and they come from South China. Um, it, uh, Japanese communities got these wonderful, wonderful internal um, um, discussions, I'll uh, put it that way, um, dialects. Um, uh, we've been dealing with a group of, of, of uh, workers and artisans from um, who most people in Watsonville, not so much Watsonville, but everybody else would classify as as Mexicans, but they're not. This particular group happened to be all from El Salvador. And the, another group that we've been working with was from El Salvador and Guatemala, from everywhere. And, they, and some of them didn't even speak Spanish. Um, they were treaties, they were people from uh, indigenous groups. I think this is an argument, and this particular story is an argument, for drilling down and listening and trying to understand uh, you know, the stereotypes that, that frequently come with immigrant groups. That, it's the stereotypes that get us in trouble um, because it's the stereotypes that eventually blossom, if you're a terrible pun there, but uh, that, that blossom into the stereotypes of things that bring um, anti-immigrant um, legislation. I can't overemphasize 1924. 82 and 24 are the two, two years you need to remember. 1882, Chinese exclusion, the only time uh, people have been excluded by race from coming to the United States of America in its history. And then 1924, which was the tightening of 21, which not only got all the Southern and Eastern Europeans, but as, as and I'll hammer it, uh, in 21, it, it included the Japanese, um, and, and the Chinese had already been excluded. Um, we, we're not good at this, and we're not good at this, and we are not being good at this. Um, and you know, it, 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 it it breaks my heart. Why do we have to do it again? <sighs> Thank you. A great book on this very subject. So it was 1924, but the people behind it had been working on it for 30 or 40 years, a concerted effort. So the book is The Guarded Gates by Okrent. O-K-R-E-N-T, and if you, um, that really shows the detail and the thought and the, the craziness, because they proved it scientifically, but they were wrong. And, and they just forgot, they forgot a, a couple of important details. And so, even though they proved it, they made it legal, but it was all based on something entirely wrong. <laughs> Did the other uh, nationalities come over to uh, about the same time, like Serbia and Bosnia? They, they come with their animals. Did they come over? <laughs> Not so, necessarily here, but they, they come over. So, uh, is this on? No. Yeah, okay. Oh, so, uh, there were very few Serbian families in Watsonville. I think there were like maybe six, something like that. There were definitely Serbs in Watsonville, but the comparison, the reason that we did our book on the Croatians is because there were thousands of Croatians. Was I mean, there animosity between the two groups? No, not in Watsonville. Mm -hmm. In Watsonville, I, I don't really think, I think that there was, somebody might be able to correct a little bit during the war between 91 and 95, mm -hmm. there was, there was tension. Yes. As long as they separated somewhere else. I'm sorry? sorry. The microphone. Is that better? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. better. Um, realize that um, Croatia had the port, um, so and they were the shipping, traveling country. Um, when 
you, when Yugoslavia was made after World War II and combined Bosnia with Serbia, that was not a natural. That was a shoved together to get this done. So when we think about to early immigration, in general, Bosnians and Serbs were not there on the coast immigrating emigrating in the same way that the Croatians were. And then once the Croatians had established, originally jumped ship in San Francisco and started something happening and jumped ship down in New Orleans and, and started something happening. Once they figured out it could work here, believe me, you're going to tell all your brothers who are second brothers who aren't going to inherit anything, yeah. hey, there's land and there's work. And so that word spread among Croatians in a way that it didn't happen in some of the other countries because those other countries weren't seafaring countries and didn't get the first guys here to spread the word as quickly. Another point that I just want to, this might seem apparent, but that little region of Konopoli that we were talking about that's just south of Dubrovnik, there are about 30 villages and they've all been, I mean, everyone is related to everyone else. And it's, they still, to this day, they, they, they gather, they're still, you know, it's occasionally someone's marrying out, but it is a very, very <laughs> tight community. And that, you know, that whole thing about your reputation is because your entire community knows exactly who you are, who your parents, who your grandparents, who your great, great grandparents is, what your, how your family was during the world, world war two. I mean, which side were you on? I mean, they know everything. And so it really keeps everybody, you know, I mean, there's good and bad about that. There are things that are very hard about it, but they're good things about it too. Way in the back. You know, I really like the double gems like at the altar of the textiles <laughs> because they're outstandingly beautiful. These were all done by our great aunt who is no longer with us, but she also this was her dress. Oh. And it speaks to how Pajaro Valley has come together through textiles and networking through the Pajaro Valley Quilters Association, which many of my friends are Probably late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Because it's sure. beautiful that you showed it today. Thank you. Russell. Uh, yeah, there was significant from the, for the Italian immigrants. There was significant repatriation back to Italy. I've heard estimates twenty-five to thirty-five percent of them went back to Italy. Was there a strong return back to the home? Country? Are you talking about World War Two? No, no. Even during the 1800s, when they came, they got successful. They said, "Well, I'm going back home," right? Yeah. And they went back, and it was not, estimates were up to 30. Not that many Croatians went back. That the some of the wealthier families that we showed you, you know, you see the guys in the suits like Letnich and some of they did go back to visit, and it was very expensive to do that because it's you know it's a boat, and it's you know it's a it's a like a three month trip, but no people didn't go back very much, so different. With so many um, involved in the shipping, that, that slide of the family, the businesses right next to each other. So I'm wondering, how did, uh, was there a, well, obviously a competition, but a rivalry? How did that affect the closeness of the community with the competition like that? And marrying families, was there this is a, a, did, a lot of fun. So it, in that slide, um, I haven't, I, I don't know it thoroughly, but I do know that some of those families are, my sister is married to the neighbor who is my competitor. So you're, you're right about that interconnectedness. Um, in uh, the Pajaro Valley Historical Association, there, there are code books. Now, when you were going to send a telegram, um, there became codes so that it, telegrams don't take so long. And, and telegrams were important to find what city you're going to send produce to. So they're using coded messages. 
But what these guys that live next door to each other do, they develop separate codes with their own clients. So now I have found you, Mr. Client, who is 30 miles outside of Chicago, and you don't have a source for your fruit. Okay, I'm going to be your, so your source, and we're going to talk like this. And you develop a code. And so you, you <laughs> have your own personal language and they didn't share their codes to, and, and the codes are not shared with your sister-in-law like yeah. yes yes that, it's very much like your password on your phone you're you're not um if you're doing a deal you don't want you you, you love your brother-in-law dearly and you're going to have dinner with him saturday but you're not sharing your business deal <laughs> yeah, so that could be one of the reasons that we from the outside because of that internal stuff, yeah. had difficulty having conversations, uh -oh. even though it was long afterward. How, uh, where, where are the trust lines is a really interesting story, and that's what you're, you're talking about. And the trust lines definitely when don't go. When it business, they're very quiet. They don't, they don't share their business. They're, they're, they are our father, generations later, on Pacific Avenue, will not talk about what he is doing because in the back of his mind, if he says out loud that he has this contact, somebody's gonna take it away from him. So, so generations later, there's still this sense, they've been through so, their diplomacy in the Dubrovnik region was fantastic, but they developed that because it was so threatening to live. And so you learn to be a diploma, diplomat, and you lean, learn to keep your mouth shut about everything else because it's going to be gone. Yeah. The question about the apple packers and shippers all alongside that row. It, it's, it's, so there's that answer, which is correct. The other answer is perhaps that was the best location for the purpose, the railroad line, and 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 and, and, the, and the trucking street behind, all that kind of stuff, and so you could say it in a way where best location, 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 location. Yeah. Besides, it turned out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But but they did all still party together, you know. So even though this is all going on, they're all Saturday night. They're down here, and then they're with so. I mean, so the, the social life is still very much inclusive, but the business stays quiet. Michael, the language. What happened to the language, uh, the Croatian language, as far as Yugoslavian language? I know that our father didn't teach it past his own generation. And I know you you started learning it. But what this, this is our brother Michael. <laughs> but, but what happened to the language as far as over in Watsonville, as far as being able to be carried on? Right. And I also remember that when our father went back to Croatia and was talking, they would say, "Oh, you you're talking like our grandfather." Yeah. Well, language language changes, you know, over time, and our dad spoke a dialect um, that was from his parents' time, which would have been the late 1800s. And all of the Croatians who came to Watsonville are bringing the language of the time, you know, that what, what, was, what was being spoken in their household at the time they arrived in Watsonville. And then once they get here, there's a lot of English that moves into that. Like our grandmother used to call shoes, shoeze. Well, you know, it's like, that's not, you know, that's just like putting a Croatian ending on, a, on an American word. Um, you know, so there was a little bit of mixing like that that was going on. But everyone, when, when dad went back to Croatia, everyone understood him. There was, he was absolutely fluent, but it was in the old language, old dialect of 100 years before, because the language has progressed so much. And now it's progressed even more, so that when Kathy and I first started studying Croatian language, and he was still alive. I remember we would, I would come home and, you know, be telling him what I was learning, and he was saying, "No, no, 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 no. What, what are they teaching you?" I mean, he was really a bit agitated about it, <laughs> because it was not the language that he knew. And I, and so I had to stop doing that. I had to stop going up and trying to talk to him about it because it was so different than the language that he spoke. Is it still being spoken, Watson? 
Oh yeah, there are still people in Croatia in Wasi. That, that are young, under thirty years old. Well, our teacher. Um, there's several people in our class. <laughs> <laughs> um, our teacher, John Bassor, has been teaching now for about what twenty, almost twenty years, I think, and he was born in Croatia. Is the next generation running it though? His kids do. Okay. The, the, what, what we experienced is the most common experience of many immigrant cultures, when you kind of struggle, you, English is not your first language. For dad, English was not his first language. He goes to school, it's hard, he's embarrassed, he can't figure it out, and then he figures it out just fine pretty soon, and then he's thinking about raising his kids, and he's going, I'm not giving them that burden. They're gonna, they're gonna be American, American only. In fact, when we went on those Sundays, when we're at the family houses, what happened? We got scooted out. Get outside. Because they were going to speak the language. And we were not to be, we were purposely excluded from that. And that's a real, not every culture, but lots of cultures that unfortunately happens. Yeah. Let me make a plug. A, a, a plug. We did the, when did we do the class? The, the extension class where we... That many? Yeah, more than 10 years ago. Ten, ten years ago, we did a class um, through Cabrillo Extension. God bless Cabrillo Extension. Um, the three of us did a class on this subject, but in Watsonville. Um, and we walked and we had lunch in a packing shed, um, which now, which at that time was a, a tool rental place, didn't matter because they were nice enough to move their gear out of the way, and we could sit at tables very similar to the one you saw in the wedding picture. Uh, we didn't have the decorations, um, but you could see the structure and the, and the feel the floor. Um, and we went to the graveyard, so we went to the graveyard, and we did, we walked up and down Main Street and looked at all the Croatian buildings. And didn't we end up at Nita's somehow? We, we ended up at Nita's, uh, yeah, Nita Gizdic, of course, because you have to. I mean, that's a, that's a requirement. And the reason I'm plugging this, that was 10 years ago. I'll bet, I'll bet that we could set something like that up, say, for next spring. Would that be something that you'd be interested in? So, so do a Cabrillo extension class just a day. I can see my wife now, uh, she says, but the books, you know, she's still... Pushing the book, but but I, I it would be fun, um, and and given the more that you already know now that my God, well you know what we keep learning what, what what we keep learning I go back we both go back I I tend to go back every year and we just keep having you know political conversations with you know with people there and so our knowledge about the Balkans and about the region just continues to grow because we're we're there in you know every single year and learning more and more and and it changes because you know the topic this year everyone's worried about Bosnia um, uh, and, and you know Bosnia is literally right over the mountain from these folks and Bosnia doesn't have NATO protection or EU protection, and they have three presidents. They have a Serbian president, a Croatian president, and a Muslim president, and they're not speaking to each other right now. Eight-month eight terms. Eight-month terms. So it's, it's, not, it's not a stable situation at all. And then I just read recently that the Serbian president that is over Bosnia has been in regular dialogue with Putin. So, you know, this, the, the politics over there just continue to move and shuffle, and, and people over there are worried. I mean, it's, you know, there, there's huge concern. So, we continue learning. Fred? Okay. One thing I noticed in the book is that their success engendered some resentment here. Yeah. yeah. Could you touch base on that? Because that seems like you're going to walk She doesn't have the actual questions. <laughs> um, which means you read the whole book, because we kind of tucked that in. <laughs> um, well, uh, what happened is the distributors had connection with other Croatian distributors in San Francisco. And so you, you have this stream that's, in fact, uh, Luke Scourge is the nephew of... I don't know if I can hold this straight, in, but anyway, a, a big name shipper in San Francisco. I think it's Ivankovic. Um, 
And then something really interesting happens in these early years. When there's a train, first of all, there's the armor company that sends meat from the Midwest out uh, uh, to the Pacific coast, and they have empty empty um, cars going back. And so they, they want to ship some, they want to fill it with something. And they set up some growing in the area that's outside of the Croatian community to, to ship back. And, and little by little, other, other ethnic groups too are going, well, well I, I want to be in, involved with this. Um, and that's completely natural. Until there comes a year, and I believe it's 1890, when San Francisco is pretty saturated with all of a sudden the supply catches up with the demand. Um, and so the distributors here in Watsonville, the guys getting stuff on the trains, are going, oh shoot, there's more apples here than we can sell in San Francisco. The prices are gonna drop if we, if we do this. And so they don't agree to buy other people's crops except their own second cousin and their nephew and their uncle. And they so, their own thing going on. so these guys get left out and they are going, oh, what do we do now? We've got, what are we, what are we gonna do? And so their goal is to set up an alternate system. And because in their minds, these Croatian guys, just screw them, <laughs> you know, they, they, they're feeling they're left behind. And so they're angry about it. And so they set, they s want to set up their own distribution system. And that, and you'll see in the book that it does happen and that the, and that they will pass, go to the, the uh, state government and try and pass legislation for inspections, which it's, it's, the Croatians definitely take it as a ruse to undermine their business because they had not taken care of these guys. And that, and the alternate group does go out of business. It doesn't take them very long, but they do go out of business. But yes, there was definitely a push. Let's get these guys out of the distribution business so that um, we, we don't have to depend on them. Yeah. I think it's time to be wrapping up. Um, and I think that we are, we are going to be signing and selling books. Um, and if any of you want to come up and ask other questions while we're doing that, that would be fine. One more thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. On, on this subject, the way you guys carry the, the depth of information by tag teaming off each other, that was really well done. Thank you. Well, we, we know we did different parts of the book. You know, Kathy did all of the agricultural history, and I did history and culture in general. And so it's, you know, it, that's, and that's how we present it as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you guys could give a plug about uh, Kathleen Crochetti's project in Watsonville. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Does everyone know yeah. about, about Catherine Crochetti's um, mural that's going up in Watsonville? That is. So, George? You're the one that should say that. I think you should do it from your point of view. Okay. All right, okay. I'll, I'm the, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of you know Kathleen Crochetti? We, do we have a few? So she's a local artist, a very well-known local artist. She also teaches at, um, at Michigan Hill Middle School. And she's just the most... She's a visionary. She's an absolute visionary. And she's been doing projects... She does mosaic tiles, and she's been doing work all over Santa Cruz County. And I don't know how long ago, that's what I'm not gonna know, but it's like maybe, yeah, you know, five years ago, whatever, but she has started working on this gigantic mural project in Watsonville that is stories high. It's, it's basically the entire parking garage behind the city of Watsonville building. And what she is attempting to do is do images that represent all of the immigrant groups to the Pajaro Valley. And in her all, it's so funny. I mean, I've always grown up thinking, okay, we've got, you know, right, Azorians, Croatians, Irish, Chinese, Japanese. She's including any student in any of her classes that are saying, I came from that country, whether they're, everyone is included. And the, the groups are putting together a, a, an image that represents them, and they're going up on this. It's going to be like, 
They're calling it the Taj Mahal. I mean, it's giant and it's beautiful. And George is involved. He's the chairman of the board. Yes. <laughs> I just want to say that this includes indigenous groups too. Yes. yes. So, and, and, yeah. and we usually when we're talking about this mix that comes, we get stuck in our head that we're talking about um, Asian and European groups and we forget, and or even if we're talking about Mexican and Salvadoran, we forget that like our grandparents, they didn't consider themselves Austrian. Some of these groups do not consider themselves Mexican or Salvadoran, and, and so the, the range is just a fantastic So you can go down and take a look. It's the parking lot behind the city of, of Watsonville, and it's going up. And it's going to be done in about two years, I think, about about two more years. And we, we have, our family has a channel that's going over there. It's halfway done right now. So it's two and a half more years. It's a five-year project. They have 120 groups. Um, you can check in what we have right now. Uh, do uh, Google Watsonville Brillante. And we want to get as many more from uh, countries, groups, the uh, lot of Native American groups, because there are so many people from Mexico, there's one for every state. I think it's 90% in Watsonville, something like that. But one of the highlights is going to be the cover of this book on the Mecca's family uh, mural. There's a, so, yeah. So, so it's going to be a wonderful thing. Thanks.